All right. Good evening, everyone. So, you're at a panel discussion about land use. Is everyone in the right place? <laughs> yeah? Uh, who here has been to the Murder of Tom Moore exhibit? All right, if your hand is not raised, make sure to take the time to visit the exhibit between now and uh, May 2024. It's the reason why we're here today. The Museum of Ventura County is really interested in, in diving into these land use issues. And um, yeah, since we're all in the right place, we know where we are, I think it's time to get started. So I'm Maureen McGuire, I'm the CEO of the Farm Bureau of Ventura County, and I'm really honored to be with you guys here today, and I was really thankful to be part of helping put this discussion together and um, you know, connect with these esteemed panelists. And I also wanna thank you all for being here today and being part of this discussion. As we begin this event, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Chumash people, who have stewarded this land for more than 13,000 years. This land was founded upon the exploitation and violence against indigenous people and the unceded territories of the Chumash communities. As we move forward in our program, we are mindful to honor these ancestral grounds and support the resilience and strength of the Chumash people today. Thank you. So today we're here essentially to have a conversation. That means that the panelists will be taking the opportunity to speak back and forth, but they're also going to have time to present their own complete ideas as well. And I want to remind everyone that we're not going to solve these issues today. <laughs> and also that not all interests are represented here. There are lots of organizations, community groups, and individuals that need to be part of this ongoing and actually never-ending conversation about the shape and future of our community. I'm really excited to introduce our panelists. First, I would like to introduce uh, Julie Toma Mait Stensley, who is a Chumash elder. Julie uh, has traced her family lineage from her father, Vincent uh, Tumamait, to at least 11 known Chumash villages and as far back as the mid 18th century. She's worked as a cultural resource consultant from the Malibu to Santa Barbara to the Channel Islands, providing guidance for private groups and state, county, and city regulatory agencies, including the Ventura and Santa Barbara County District Attorney's offices. She's well known throughout Ventura County and beyond for her Chumash cultural education programs and also performs ceremonies according to her native ways, such as weddings, burials, naming ceremonies, and blessings. She's a commissioner on the California Native American Heritage Commission and on the board of the Santa Clara River Conservancy. She serves on the Ascensions Commission a Committee for the Museum of Ventura County. I'd also like to welcome Alyssa Terry of Amigos Fuerza. Alyssa is one of only two female farm labor contractors in Ventura County, currently representing about 100 field workers at Amigos Fuerza Incorporated. She began her career in agriculture, working as a Spanish to English translator and interpreter, later transitioning into occupational health and safety before becoming a registered farm, registered farm labor contractor with the California Department of Industrial Relations in 2015. Her family has worked in agriculture in Ventura County over five generations, ever since her great-grandfather immigrated to California from Portugal in the late 1800s. Additionally, I want to introduce uh, Melissa Baffa, Executive Director of the Ventura Land Trust. Melissa is the executive director of the Ventura Land Trust. She's worked in nonprofit management for 15 years, most recently with the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. 
Bafa spent more than a decade in the classroom prior to that, teaching middle school science in Simi Valley, marine bi biology in the Upward Bound program at California Lutheran University, and adult classes at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at California State University Channel Islands. She also served as a research associate at Amgen during the early biotech boom of the 1990s. In 2015, she was selected a science communication fellow with the Ocean Exploration Trust, exploring the deep sea as part of Dr. Robert Ballard's core of exploration in 2015, 16, and 18. She's an avid nature and an outdoors enthusiast and is very active in her community, serving on a variety of boards. Melissa graduated from California Lutheran University in 1995 with a Bachelor of Science degree in biology and lives in Ventura. And finally, Matthew Fina. He's the Executive Director of the Center of Economic Research and Forecasting at California Lutheran University. He's also an Associate Professor of Economics in the School's Master of Quantitative Economics program. Matthew's an applied economist who specializes in econometrics, economic policy analysis, land use, and environmental markets. Matthew is a member of the Wall Street Journal Economic Forecasting Survey and was a recipient of the 2019, 2020, and 2021 Crystal Ball Awards for the, for the Zillow, formerly Case Schiller, Home Price Expectation Survey. SURF's U.S. Home Price Forecast received multiple top three rankings among more than 100 forecasts included in the survey. Matthew returned to school to pursue his PhD after running a small business in Ventura County for more than a decade. His other specialties include California natural history, technical rock climbing, and photography. Matthew graduated summa cum laude from the Brooks Institute of Photography and has spent more than 15 years working as a professional climbing guide. He completed his doctorate in environmental economics at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara. So did I miss anything? <laughs> All right. I am so struck by the caliber of people that we have up here. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I'm going to ask a series of questions, and we're going to pass the mic around from panelist to panelist. And I'll guide you on the order in which we're going to answer the questions, because I want to hear from different people each time in a different order, and just sort of get a variety of perspectives. So our first question, and I have to pull up my timer because I will just let it go on the more that I get in, uh, intrigued by the answers. But we're going to try to do about three minutes each. Uh, Layla is here to help guide people, but it's not a strict guideline. We do want to have conversation and a little bit back and forth. So my first question is, uh, what are the historical and current land uses uh, from the lens of your organization. And I'd like to start with Julie, and then go to Melissa, then Alyssa, and then Matthew. So Melissa will have to run across the stage for, for that one. So um, Julie, just to restate the question, what are the historical and current uses of land from the lens of your organization, or your perspective? From day one, Land use for me and our, our people are ag, ranching, uh, cattle, livestock, things like that. Oil, has, uh, I think they're maybe kind of equal in the time frame. Development, um, all three of those, they're, they're what we look at today. When people came here to these regions, it's like when John Muir hit Yosemite. No man has ever stepped foot on this land. Well, it's because we left it as we found it. And our materials were part of the earth, and they dissolved back into the earth. And we moved and changed and moved about. And our society is very much what we have here today. With the you know, invention of so many industries and modernization, that has become um, a little on the excessive side. <laughs> I don't want to be too Debbie Downer on development or any of these things, but you know, as we kind of have a tendency to go over uh, and look at what has happened since all these changes have come about, we need to learn from them and and look at look at these each one of what I just mentioned: ag, oil, and development in it with a different lens. 
and where things have come about, SOAR, for instance, and where, you know, to balance that place of open space. I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting other land uses there, but these are my, you know, three main uh, ones that, that I have been dealing with since I decided to take on the, um, the challenge of how we see, try to work with that balance from the lens or perspective of Native, Native American culture and what is put to us. And I'll talk a little bit more about the laws and things as we get to the next question. But um, those, those have created uh, many, uh, the whole industry of what's happening in our ocean. And I was just out at Port Wainimi. And so there's changes happening, and people are realizing now that they have to step back a little bit with these um, three things. Because if we don't, that's the last question. I won't answer that right now. But, um, you know, we have seen growing up in Ventura, growing up in Ojai, but my grandmother lived here in Ventura. And so we've seen changes, um, not all for the good. And in between all that, you people that are not aware before laws put up have done a lot of devastation in terms of um, destroying, disturbing, uh, removing our culture that's under our feet. I, I always, it's not really a joke, but it, it is kind of funny that if you want to know our sacred places, look for the cell towers on the mountaintops because <laughs> we didn't want interruption either. So, you know, we have to, if we recognize the land, if we recognize uh, and know the land, then we know the people and how they lived here and how sustainable it was, you know, that number over 13,000 years is, is no, uh, it's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge number and it's a big feat that people, you know, walked this land and worked with it. And we're, uh, what I've seen in these uh, different you know, what I mentioned, ag, oil, and development has been working against it. Thank you. And, okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Go ahead, Melissa. Interesting that you would bring up cell phone towers on top of hills because that's actually Mariano Rancho is one of our preserves that we'll be working to open over the next couple of years, and that's there, so. <laughs> um, I was thinking about some of the preserves that Ventura Land Trust has and uh, you know the land that we protect has previously been fought over in this community for decades. It's hosted sheep and goat and cattle ranching. Uh, it's hosted farming in the form of lima beans at our Harmon Canyon Preserve. It's hosted hunting and shooting activities. It's also been the site of a family cabin visited by the family members who own the land during Prohibition because it was just far enough out of town where they could drink and play cards. Um, some of it has been deemed quote unquote worthless and so therefore those previous owners have donated that land to us or sold it to us for very little or even abandoned it and we've been able to claim it. Um, past and current the land that we preserve has hosted oil and gas infrastructure, uh, utility infrastructure, communications infrastructure, like Julie mentioned. Um, past and current, the land that we protect has hosted a number of people who are, want to camp out under the sky. Um, so our Willoughby Preserve down at Rivermouth um, has long been a site for unhoused people to live there. In fact, we've got an old railroad map going back over a hundred years that labeled that spot as Hobo Jungle. So we know that this has long been a host for people from the unhoused community. Um, and currently, the land that we protect is preserved for conservation purposes. First and foremost, we are a conservation organization. And secondly, for human recreation. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm here to speak about the agricultural perspective and thankfully we're really fortunate to have Julie here to talk more to the historical side of the land use. So for me, that um, historical answer to your questions really begins in the 1700s um, and that would be the time where um, the Spaniards owned all of the farmland in California and then they were allowing Californios 
to come and work that land. Um, it was mostly cattle from a historical perspective, and the Californios weren't allowed to own the land, so it was mostly um, Mexicans, some Spaniards, and the Spanish government owned it. After that point, um, when Mexico declared independence from Spain, then it moves into the Californios owning the land. Um, and then after that, in the 1800s, we had a couple pretty big waves of immigration with the gold rush um, beginning in 1849, and then there was a really bad drought. So that drought caused um, most of the Californios to have to sell their land. A lot of their livestock died. Um, and then moving into the uh, late 1800s and then into the 1900s even, lima bean production, um, as Melissa mentioned, I believe was, was pretty prevalent in the area. It's called dry farming. So a lot of dry farming crops were used. You needed very little water to grow those, um, but they weren't very profitable. But at the time it didn't really matter because um, the land was not quite as expensive as it is now, right? As decades go on, um, it's very expensive to live in California, right? So as a consequence, that's not just for housing, that's also for agriculture. And so now rather than dry farming lima beans or having cattle, we've sort of transitioned into row crops, which are higher value crops like strawberries, so that farmers and farm workers have a viable crop that will allow um, people to continue farming within the county, make their bills. So that's from the historical perspective and into the modern perspective um, from just the, the agricultural lens that I'm here to talk about. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, and obviously, um, you're getting a much richer historical perspective from the, my fellow panelists. You know, as an economist, First of all, my look back into history is necessarily going to be a much shorter time horizon. And really, as an economist and an environmental economist, you know, I'm always thinking about what is the balance between environmental use, urban use, and agricultural use, and what is the, really the prosperity that, that the balance between those three land use types creates. Right? As economists, we always talk about economic growth Right, that's sort of the headline capturing number that gets broadcast breathlessly every quarter or, or even more frequently. But really what we care about is not just prosperity, but broadly shared prosperity. Who gets to benefit? Who can, uh, and, and what is sort of the, the, how are standards of living changing over time? And, and maybe most importantly of all, what is the economic mobility that the balance between those three different land uses produces, right? And, and interestingly, uh, you know, Ventura County's sort of economic history is tied to land use very intimately. Basically from the 1960s through the end of the last century, Ventura County first of all had a relative abundance of, of uh, open space and undeveloped land. Uh, and as a result of that, it was a real economic hotspot in the state. In fact, in the 60s, the population of Ventura County inc almost doubled. In the 70s, it, inc it increased almost 50%. Uh, and even though that population growth slowed over time, Ventura County's population always grew more rapidly than uh, the broader state, and really because of the abundance of land. As population was growing, open space and agricultural land were being converted to developed uses, to housing, and also to uh, commercial and industrial space, right? And it produced an abundance of economic growth. Um, as you may know, the end of the last century, of course, was a time of real abundance uh, economically California-wide with, the, with um, the, the incredible uh, economic growth that was spun out of Silicon Valley during the tech boom. We benefited from that here. Interestingly, um, and I hope to elaborate on this in, in future questions, um, economic growth is also highly correlated with environmental um, sentiment, environmental concern. And so it's not surprising that the end of the 90s were actually a period of abundant changes in land use policies across the state where we tried to rein in some of the excesses. And, and literally, um, uh, by the end of the last century, um, there were about 25% of all metro areas in the United States had some kind of land use restriction, urban growth restriction. And in California, during those last few years of the last century, 37 different communities had ballot measures reining in um, land use. Uh, and urban growth. Interestingly, Ventura County actually engaged in an experiment and adopted the most stringent urban growth controls of any county in the United States. Uh, and, that, and that has had an impact on the economic trajectory of the county. It also means that it's had an impact on 
um, how broadly shared prosperity is, um, how, how much economic mobility is available in the county, and just to leave you with sort of two pretty arresting statistics, in the 80s and 90s, Ventura County routinely scored among the most, the highest economic mobility of any county in the United States. The opportunity for a child to be born in the lowest quintile, income quintile, and during their lifetime moved to the top quintile was better here than almost any county in the United States. Unfortunately, in the economic uh, uh, two, first two decades of this century, uh, there's been a very different trajectory for the county, and in fact, you know, in 2014, Ventura County actually ranked as 96th out of the 100 largest uh, metro areas in the United States for economic mobility. That's to say we're one of the most unequal, um, and, and as we'll talk about, some of that is related uh, to land use. Uh, and so land use is intimately tied um, to the economic history of the county in ways that I think are important to balance. Great, thank you. So now you've got to hear a little bit from our panelists. I feel even more excited about the rest of this panel, right? I mean, the perspectives that people are bringing forward. Like I said, it's not every perspective, but boy, I am just really thankful for you guys being here and, and sharing your, your perspective with us here today. So our next question is actually a two-part question. So, <clears throat> question one of two, what current attitude, beliefs, or policies affect your organizations or your perspectives, goals, and how? And then what improvements would you like to see in how land is used and managed? And I'd like to start off with Alyssa and then go um, Matthew, Melissa, and end with Julie. Sure, yeah, so something that is um, really challenging in the agricultural industry in Ventura County is something called ag-urban interface. So something unique here is that we're probably one of the only places in the country or one of the most common places in the country where you could find an acre of ag land right next to um, a, a park, right next to a school, another little tract of ag land, and then a busy shopping center, just an example. And so that affects how we in agriculture can do our jobs because we need to be mindful of our neighbors, right? And a lot of that mindfulness has come about in um, different regulations, ordinances, laws um, that are unique to Ventura County. One of those is SOAR, which stands for Save Our Agricultural Resources. Um, another one of those is um, just water regulations. Um, and then uh, with the Ag Urban Interface comes um, noise ordinances, uh, comes um, buffer zones for different types of organic and conventional um, fertilizers and pest control. And so those would probably be um, some of the current um, challenges that we have in agriculture as it relates to um, behaviors and land attitudes at the county. And then as far as improvements go, um, I, I would like to see um, people really making agriculture a priority in our community. When I speak to the public or interface with the public, a lot of people will tell me that agriculture is important to them and important to our county, and they point to SOAR, and they say, well, look, of course it's important to us. We passed something um, to save our farms, right? But when it really comes down to making some of these tough decisions or tolerating um, noises and smells that come from farms, I've found that it doesn't really seem to be the case in practice. So that's something I would like to see change. A really uh, good example of that, I think, was the hemp moratorium um, that went into place. I was a part of those hearings. Um, I brought around 30 farm workers to those hearings and set up um, translating for them so that they could participate in those. And, um, you know, resoundingly, everybody wanted to work in hemp. It was really seen as a savior crop for our community, especially with um, water restriction challenges, living through a pretty big drought, obviously, and having lots of um, pest challenges with uh, bugs like the Asian citrus psyllid. And so that was disappointing to me, to see that our community, rather than rallying around our farmers and farm workers and supporting a really innovative crop like hemp, decided that because it smelled bad, they didn't want it near them. Um, so that's uh, an example of something I'd like to see change. Thank you. Um, to sort of jump off Alyssa's comment about the ag-urban interface, one of the things that's interesting about Ventura County is we do have 
the most abrupt ag-urban interface that you will find anywhere in the United States. In fact, you might have $2 million an acre prime residential on one side of the street, and on the other side of the street have agricultural land, you know, uh, that may be worth $100,000 an acre. So it's not just the most abrupt visually, it's not just, it's the most abrupt in terms of property values and other measures. And, and so really I sort of see one of the primary, the, like the, one of the primary uh, land use issues from the perspective of an economist is the need for more housing. Um, so we have this abrupt ag-urban interface because between 1998 and 2000 we passed a series of land use restrictions in Ventura County that capped, set a strict urban growth boundary, capped the amount of developable land, and then requires ballot initiative, in, in many cases a vote of the county electorate to, to move those um, growth boundaries. There is no consideration of future population growth. We don't forecast future needs. And this is one of the reasons that by most estimates we are now have a deficit of about 30,000 housing units. And that's having a really meaningful impact on economic growth and more importantly on prosperity and upward mobility. Um, and so, um, um, yeah, so I think this is sort of one of the, we need to, we need to have a candid, and I think we're doing it here today, a candid conversation about how we balance, um, balance competing um, demands on the land. And, and I really think there's going to be some questions later in the discussion about collaboration and, and creative ideas. What's really interesting is that there is some really, Venture County is incredibly innovative. There's really interesting stuff doing, happening. Demonstrations that you actually can balance a lot of these needs. You can do what's right for the environment at the same time that you're housing your workforce and creating upward mobility for all. So that, that's the kind of stuff I get really, really excited about. Um, I do just want to share some, some more numbers since I'm an economist, because um, I think this may surprise some of the folks in the room. I've talked about the change around 2000 and the economic trajectory of Ventura County. Again, we went from one of the economic hotspots in the state um, and one of the most upwardly mobile um, uh, and economically inclusive counties um, in all of California um, to one um, where there's less inclusion. Um, total economic output in Ventura County peaked in 2007. The entire size of the economy from 2007 and the 12 years that followed declined by 15%. The total economic output declined. $13 billion of that was in biotechnology as businesses and jobs relocated to other parts of the country. The civilian labor force, the number of people in Ventura County with a job peaked in 2012, right, and is now down about 5%. There's 5% fewer people living here today who have a job than there was in 2012. The population peaked in 2015, right, and is on a, now a, a, fortunately not a steep decline, but it is an accelerating decline. In fact, net migration, more people leave every year for Ventura, from Ventura County to somewhere else in the U.S. than come, and that out migration is accelerating. Uh, jobs is sort of the bright spot, right? Jobs are actually at an all-time peak today. Um, but what's interesting is jobs are at an all-time peak, yet the number of people who live here who have a job is in decline. That means the jobs we create are being taken by people who can't afford to live in the county, and that's why we have hundreds of thousands of people crossing the, crossing the county line as they sort between work um, and home. Uh, and so I, I really think, again, this sort of um, speaks to the, the, the issue of balance. Um, and again, I look forward to my panelists' comments in that regard. For us, there, of course, SOAR has impacted our work in a lot of ways, SOAR has given land trusts like us a seat at the table. Otherwise, land is too expensive for us to acquire. Um, 30 by 30 is a big initiative to put away 30% of our available open space by 2030. That's a really ambitious goal to try and hit in the next seven years. Uh, other things that affect us, Endangered Species Act, stormwater management, uh, other water quality and water protection measures, um, wildlife protection, including wildlife corridors, wildfire protection. Um, I would like to, as I start on thinking about the second half of this question, what would I like to see different? I would like to propose a concept that we consider that biodiversity have personhood. That if, according to the Citizens United decision, that corporations could have personhood, um, who and they're certainly not alive, that perhaps living things like 
you know, more than just humans could have personhood. And I think that if we approached our economics and our policies in that sort of way, um, we would be making much wiser decisions about land use and about, you know, what happens in our communities. Um, and I know that Julie will probably follow up on that idea a little bit. Um, also, I think that for a long time, under the current property laws that we have, um, land's value is often defined by what kinds of resources we can extract from it. And in that extractive economy, then what we do is we look at a piece of land and we say, how much money can I make off of it for timber or for, you know, in the old days for pelts? Or can I grow crops on it? And land is considered useless if we can't extract something from it. And so in that extractive economy, we're not factoring in that complex web of life that lives there that has value and provides services to the planet that we all depend upon. Um, there's devastating consequences for us as a species and for life on our planet if we can only think about how much money can I pull out of this. Um, we know that land provides opportunity for recreation, which is good for our physical, mental, and emotional health. So it's important that we have places, open space, that we can connect with nature, that we can reconnect with our life forces, and we can rejuvenate ourselves. And so um, one last point. Since there's a lot of intersectionality between environmental issues and social justice and environmental justice, I would add that we need to make better land decisions through the equity lens. Mm -hmm. Because for far too long, we've dumped undesirable land use decisions on communities of color. And so what ends up happening is that the choicest pieces of land are put aside for the most affluent who tend to also be the most Caucasian. And so we see that in our own county in many places, and we need to have a different set of decision-making tools. Thank you. Very well put. Yeah. <sighs> We're great. So it's a lot, it's a lot to, for our, my part, I, you know, everybody has, when you invest in a culture, when, when people say, oh, how does it feel to be in your homeland to me? Say, go home. I, I can't explain it. To have, you know, known, 11 known villages, just known, where we know there's more, 13,000 years, we know that's more. To have that footprint that deep and that long. I grew up in the river bottom in Miner's Oaks. Little did I know it was the same river that my great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother played in you know, the village of Matilha, to know these names of our villages, to have that relationship that I do now that we didn't have growing up. The issue and the concerns we have, or what all of us have today, is the overexpansion, the, um, the overpricing, people moving away from the nature instead of coming to it and, and allowing them, as you said, the peoplehood. Um, Joseph Campbell said it best, when you refer to plants and animals as they or thou, it gives a whole different heartfelt and a whole different expression of how you treat the earth. For people, women, and, and other country, uh, native nations that refer to their favorite medicine plant as a son, that I love him dearly. <laughs> and that's because it healed her and it heals, it continues to heal. We are the land as native peoples here, and our, our, our concern started, for me anyway, is trying to decipher and, and split apart CEQA. Got involved in archeolo archeological work with, um, during CEQA's 70s, came into play, and cultural resources became part of that. So, but it wasn't us who were doing it, it was archeologists. Archeologists said, why are we putting significance on these people's items and their sacred places? Uh, they're still here. So slowly and little native peoples got involved in that. And it is, I love, <laughs> go look for rocks and shell. Oh good, <laughs> I can do that. And it was surprising just how um, 
the senses get touched when you're holding your relative that has been buried for a couple thousand years and, and you, you go, wow, am I really related to this individual as you cradle them into their next reburial place? So it doesn't make it easy for us. That's one of the concerns of when something is there and it's sacred and it should be noted as sanctified, that it shouldn't be touched. They shouldn't be removed out of their resting place. But unfortunately, it, it, it's too much money, it's too much time, and nobody wants to stop progress. So they get moved. And that has been some of the first things I started doing back nearly 40 years ago, is reburying and having to replace and uh, move our, our cemeteries. The, the process of oil, and it was mentioned already, is, you know, again, I don't think we'll ever get off of fossil fuel, but we have to make that move. And with that, you know, we, we just had that jolt. How many of you felt the jolt? <laughs> that was a big one. I was four miles away from the epicenter when it hit in Ojai. And it reminds us, you know, in our traditional world, we're, we're three worlds, the lower world, and between our middle and lower world, there's some serpents that hold up that world. And when they get tired and they shake, boom, <laughs> sway and shake, rock and roll. And, and I always say, if we're not careful, you know, they're, they're, we tell these stories. We tell our stories, and, and all around the world we have our stories that we need to remind ourselves of. Uh, the, the, the introduction of invasive plants fueled Thomas and Woolsey fire. It fueled Lahaina and Maui. Mm -hmm. and, if we're, and where our native environments are still referred to as weeds, <laughs> Uh, we have to look at the benefits of them. So the goals, there's a lot more I can talk to, and I'll do some later. But the goals is that I've written down several things. For instance, back of this museum, a native garden. If you haven't been back there, sit with it for a little bit. It is just spectacular what's, what that's been happening. Green Valley Coalition has the high school kids going around businesses looking for space taking out those invasive plants, non-natives, and putting pollinator plants. Because if we lose our butterflies, uh, yeah, there's so much of a cycle that this earth has, and, and you know things I've learned along the way, that uh, our insects, beetles, bugs, caterpillars, won't host on non-native plants. The birds won't lay, because they don't have food. So it's a cycle that goes on. We need to start recognizing these things. So they're, they're putting the pollinator plants in. They are um, other places in Ojai, city of Ojai, restored Middle Stewart Canyon. It's an immediate reaction when you remove non-native plants, the eucalyptus, the arundo, the eucalyptus on Santa Cruz Island within an hour after removing a grove, water's filling in the cistern. That's how fast it was happening to return. And where I understand people coming in here, coming in from another land, I'm not leaving my plant home. I'm not leaving for them their medicine. They don't know where they're coming from. So I was dissing English ivy. Mm -hmm. And you know, during COVID, people were using for COVID, English ivy and Yerba Santa are two, uh, the, our native respiratory plant, and English ivy is a respiratory plant for those of you who don't know. So in combination of two, people were using them. So now I don't diss them anymore. It's not their, pro <laughs> that's not their fault they're he here. Yeah. They were brought over against their will. <laughs> but I mean, people move. People move from aggression, from you know, p uh, poor, you know, uh, enslaving, even with their own people in other countries. You come to another place, you see the beauty of the land, but you dismiss the properties of it. So the goals are, is to reintroduce yourself to this land. Find out the benefits of our native plants. We could live like native Chumash people, except we don't, we don't want to, it's too slow. <laughs> we just gotta get it all right now. So, but I mean, for your own benefit, for your own yards, for your own water bills. I knew water was, 10 years ago, I was talking about water wars. And, you know, again, these rains that have come, uh, we don't diss those things, we actually pray for them and call them in. And yeah. so do still a lot of indigenous peoples around the world. So, you know, um, Zuni, we just got to see a, a ceremony of them bringing in the Kachinas there and the Pueblo just calling in 
the last ceremony to call the rain in for the year. And it is powerful. You won't see that here because there's not enough of us invested in that. Not yet, anyway. Those are some of my other goals, too, is to get. Now, I don't want you to be Chumash and doing our ceremonies, but you have them, too. Yeah. You have them. You have everybody can bring their prayers in. And I think they're, they are powerful. So when we look at, at what we've done so far, um, I don't know if you know Net Zero. Drew Shula, he's in LA. I attended oof, probably five, six years ago. 40% of the carbon emissions come out of the high rises in LA. 40%, that's a lot. So we think about what we've, what we've done so far and how we can pull it back a little bit. And housing, oh yeah, that's, that's, that is a big one and we are desperate, we are desperate for that. We shouldn't, you know, the oil companies with the fracking, you know, again, that's get back to those earthquakes. We don't need that. We just don't need that. And to put, you know, facilities and, and infrastructure in disadvantaged communities is, uh, it's not right. It's their health and their well-being that's at stake. So it's, it's, the, it's the needs versus the wants is where we have to start looking at and, and how we live. So I think I'm... Done. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, it's a great transition. I think you um, really connected with our next question uh, as well. So uh, thanks for teeing it up. And um, our next question, and I'd like to start with Melissa, and then if there's anything that Julie wants to add, and then go with uh, Matthew and end with Alyssa. So the question is, how are different stakeholders working together in all of the land uses? So on behalf of my organization, we partner, collaborate, communicate with a number of different organizations and coalitions, local, state, federal government, uh, SOAR, national, state, and county parks, Caltrans, um, because of the uh, freeway at Willoughby, right? So Caltrans is right next to us there. Um, utility and energy companies, as I've mentioned before. Um, the Ventura County Resilient Ag Lands Initiative is something that's been going on for a number of years, and uh, we have a seat at that table. Uh, we collaborate with the Shumash, uh, particularly if we are going to put in uh, new trails or other features on our preserves. We have monitors who come in um, and uh, consultants. and. Um, River, uh, river or watershed protection groups for both the Ventura and the Santa Clara River watersheds, uh, other environmental organizations and coalitions, and other non-environmental nonprofit organizations. Um, for example, this past week we partnered with Diversity Collective um, to both host a booth at VC Pride on Saturday, but we also hosted a Pride hike. Uh, at Harmon Canyon Preserve, because one of the things that many of us here in open space is that, you know, these na na um, natural lands that we are protecting don't feel welcoming to everybody, that um, many people of color feel like they aren't welcome, or people from the LGBTQ plus community don't feel welcome or don't feel safe, and so that's something that we are actively trying to change on our lands. Uh, if you have hiked at Harmon, you may notice that it's a very welcoming, friendly place. And we've consciously tried to cultivate that. Our staff always wave and say hello to people and stop to talk. We've recruited a number of docents who are also very outgoing. And um, that's just something that we really believe in to our core. Um, school districts, both Ventura and Rio, we've partnered with Cal State Channel Islands, other land trusts, Land Trust Alliance, which actually provides our accreditation, making sure that we meet those standards that are set forth, the California Council of Land Trusts, private landowners, and community members. So as we're working to open up Mariano Rancho to the public, we've had a series of community meetings in which we have asked the community to participate, to learn about some of our plans and provide feedback. It's really important because we recognize that the decisions that we're making now will have impact for generations upon generations. And so we're trying to be very thoughtful and deliberate. Thank you. Julie? 
So I was told through um, Dr. John Johnson out in the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History says, you know, your family and all the other families who live out there in Ventura and around, you all have <clears throat> the great potential and the proof of ancestry that you can get federal recognition. So I said, yeah. So we had a meeting in 2001. And then nothing happened. Nobody came about. No one stood up. So in 2002, I said, are we doing this thing or not? <laughs> so I, so I, I formed the Barbareño Ventureño Band of Mission Indians. And where I really wanted a native name, he said, well, you know, the federal government likes that word mission in there. So, you know. But anyway, the criteria for federal recognition, are there were seven. I don't know the two. But one, prove who you are, have land, uh, show continuity of uh, religious continuity from beginning to now, present, you can't. Uh, show governmental uh, consistency from beginning to now. You can't do that either. 50% uh, of your um, members must be married to one another. We never do that. <laughs> back in the day, though, back in the day we did that. But, um, and I don't remember the other two, but now it's changed. But, you know, right away it's, uh, everybody thought, oh, casino, is it over my dead body? There's no way. I'd be beating feet but you know, on the pavements. But my, my goal was, as a native federally recognized group, I, even though I was not from a native recognized group, I did go to college on a, on a free because I'm just under half. And the government will, will grant you, and because we have ethnographic history here, my great grandfather stood out there and been over on Main Street here translating for Poli. And he says to him, you tell your people all the land they see is my land. And he went, okay. So he did it in a really bad way, so everybody hated him. But then, every, then he said, but except for the beachfront here, because we were promised that from the church. But it was uh, one of those papers that just kind of got filed and really never happened. But, you know, so fast forward to 20 years, I resigned last year, did a lot. We got six acres in Sadakoy. We have these relationships uh, with the federal, even though we weren't federally recognized, we got to work the Thomas and Woolsey cleanup debris where we went behind the cleanup crews hoping that we can salvage or protect or even record because some of these really multi-million dollar homes were built on village sites. Of course, perfect place to live out in Malibu, up in the upper valley of Ojai. So we were there, and I, and I made that relationship with the federal government, with Cal OES, with all these agencies. On the CEQA side, we got involved with AB 52, which if I had to mail every agency, city, county, school, Caltrans, in our territory, which is seven, 7,000 square miles. Oh, no, wait, what is it? I forgot. It's big. But anyway, it would have been over 500 letters that we would have to consult with on development projects. Mm. So I narrowed it to how far I would travel, an hour up, hour back. That was still over 300 letters. CEQA, AB 52, made it our responsibility to contact these people, say, we want to know what you're building, where you're building it, and we want to be there to be able to protect our culture. That became, back in, when CEQA first started, Native peoples were monitoring for 18 bucks an hour, which was good back then. Now it's, and to me, that's not a job, it's not a business, it's a responsibility. And I do that kind of work as well as, you know, in the schools, the relationships uh, that I've built with the schools in that mission period, little fourth, fifth grade, uh, mm -hmm. we're changing it. We're gonna change it to environmental literacy. But we're gonna keep mission period because the seniors up there need to know this stuff and that environmental justice you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Julie. Yeah, go ahead, Matthew. Uh, great. So, you know, the question was around uh, how are people, how are stakeholders working together? Uh, and I've seen some exa awesome examples of that. In every case, the pattern is just to echo two things that Melissa said. Number one, widespread recognition of the value of the environment, and that environmental conservation, environmental quality directly enhances quality of life. That recognition has been essential to the stakeholders working together. And then the other one is equity, right? Um, I didn't mention in the other economic statistics, sort of Ventura County's economic puzzle 
since 2000 has been, as I've already mentioned, total economic activity has declined sharply. The number, the population and, and uh, labor force are declining. The number of high paying jobs have been uh, receding. And yet what's been happening to home prices? You know, if I told you, if this was Econ 101, and I said, well, those are the conditions, what must be happening to home prices, you'd say they'd be declining. No. Just uh, in June, the median single-family home price hit $928,000 in Ventura County. It's, it's astronomical, right? And that, that means that um, there's real equity issues, implications to um, housing policy in Ventura County and housing's linked to land use. So that broad recognition on both sides of that, I'm actually going to quote somebody in the audience, Drew, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, so Drew Powers, city manager of the City of Thousand Oaks, he said it really well. He said, I like to look at it as a triangle. You have jobs, the environment, and housing, and in the middle of that triangle is quality of life. When in balance, you have investments in all three of those areas, right? That is so true, right? Uh, and so it's that broad recognition um, that I think has produced some of the most exciting collaborations that I've seen. Prior to, um, to uh, COVID-19, um, in, we actually assembled a group called the Housing Solutions Working Group. Linda, I hear here, was a very, very uh, valuable contributor to that process. And the idea was just to put as stakeholders representing um, all, as many stakeholders as we could represent in the room. In fact, the executive director of the Ventura Land Trust at the time was a very, very uh, valuable contributor. And the idea was, okay, so how can we work on the housing issue in a way that also invests in, in pr preservation of environmental amenities uh, and so on. Uh, and some really exciting things came out of that. Um, you know, first of all, there was an idea, uh, some ideas about using the model of a land trust um, that's used for environmental conservation in the area of housing to provide housing at lower cost for ownership housing for um, residents at lower cost. Um, the other one was that this group actually decided that they could advocate for thoughtful changes to land use and housing policy in the county. And one really exciting was Thousand Oaks was working on something exciting, I believe it was called Measure E, where they were going to downzone properties. You know, there's a cap on total number of units. They were going to downzone properties that had been built below the allowable density, actually preserve the quality of those neighborhoods in perpetuity, but then make those units available um, in along transportation corridors for dense infill development where they could build workforce housing, right? A, a, a great policy initiative. And what was really neat was we actually had this housing solutions working with 50 people representing a wide range of stakeholders actually sh pulled public comment cards, showed up in city council chambers and said, this is the right thing to do for our community, right? It honors the need for more equity um, and it also honors our uh, goals related to uh, conservation. And, and really, really exciting stuff to see when all of the stakeholders are in the room, you know, collaborating like, like Ventura County is so capable of doing. Uh, and so uh, that's just the start. I'm so excited to see what, what the future holds. Excellent. Um, from, yeah, from the agricultural perspective, um, I think that there are some positive examples of stakeholders working together. Like I said, one of the highlights for me was attending the hemp hearing, and even though it didn't go our way, um, in the agricultural community, I thought it was really heartening to see so many farm workers have a seat at the table, be offered interpreta interpretation services so that they could participate in those hearings. Um, something that I would, that I think is not working well is that it seems that, especially in our county, different stakeholders not involved in agriculture think that they know what ag people want, and so they, with all the best intentions, try to advocate for things like SOAR with the best of intentions, it sounds great on paper, and then in, in actual uh, you know, day-to-day -day activity, it, it's not beneficial to the people that it was supposed to benefit. SOAR was really great for homeowners because we're not building new housing, right? So the value of your home increases. What it is not helpful for is farm workers. We need farm worker housing. That housing, we have uh, been told by farm workers, if, if anyone would take the time to listen to them, they want it to be built on ag land because then you don't have issues with transportation. In Mexico, that is primarily how the system is set up. Um, and many farm workers are farmers as well, which I think a lot of people forget. A lot of them have farms in Mexico. And yeah, it's totally common. You live on the land, you work the land, you have um, seasonal employees, you have full-time employees, and they're able to work and live and prosper um, in that location. So I do think 
that while uh, I love hearing all the idyllic and optimistic um, opinions about ways that stakeholders are working together positively, and I do think it's worthwhile to talk about that as well, I also think that um, the reality is agriculture is a hard industry. It is not um, sitting back and watching a beautiful flower bloom. It is uh, built on blood, sweat, and tears. It is hard, back-breaking labor, and it requires tough decisions. And I would love to see our community really pull together and support farmers and farm workers in meaningful ways, not by exacerbating inequity, by passing things like SOAR that don't allow us to be dynamic with the land in ways that we really need it to be. Um, something Matthew mentioned earlier was uh, another issue with SOAR is you could have a parcel of land not covered by SOAR worth, you know, a million dollars. Right across the street, there's a parcel covered by SOAR that is worth, you know, 50000 And while I do agree with Melissa that we can't just say, well, you know, land's worthless if we can't extract anything from it, the reality of the situation is we need to be able to grow food to live. If we don't have food, we cannot eat and everybody dies. And it really is that simple. So while it's not popular to talk about things like that, we do need to sit down as a community and not just have feel-good conversations. Um, another issue with SOAR is what we are seeing is farmers from the OC who have generational land not covered by SOAR because it doesn't exist in their county, um, through something called a 1031 exchange, are selling their land for millions of dollars coming into Ventura County, buying land for pennies on the dollar and not paying taxes on those capital gains. So there are unintended consequences that while I totally believe everybody passes things with the best of intentions, um, I do think that we need to dig a little deeper as a community and listen to farmers and farm workers, um, which we claim to, to care about, right? I do believe we all care about them, um, but the reality is it, farmers and farm workers are, are not getting a seat at the table in a meaningful way, in my opinion. Thank you. Actually, keep your microphone because I want to um, switch it up a little bit. And this question I want to start with um, Alyssa, then go to Matthew, Melissa, and Julie. Um, so the question, I think this is kind of like the ultimate question of this panel, and it's the question I ask myself a lot about the work that I do sort of in advocacy for agriculture, and it's the question about the future, right? And when we were writing these questions, Layla and I, we thought it would be really interesting to split it up into categories or time periods that feel close and that also feel far away. So the question um, is, how do you envision the landscape of Ventura in 10, 20, and 50 years from now? So I want to start with uh, Alyssa. Um, with or without SOAR, I'm here to tell you if we continue on this trajectory, we will not have agriculture here anymore. Um, if we continue to keep SOAR, what you're going to see is fallowed land because we have to make tough decisions about water, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I know in the Oxnard Plains, farmers in that area are looking at um, needing to cut down 40% their water usage over the next 20 years to recharge the aquifers. Um, now, I mentioned at the very beginning um, with the first question that was asked about the way that agriculture has changed over the years. And what I was trying to, to really drive home is that we used to be able to dry farm stuff. Um, and now, as land costs increase, inflation goes along with that, um, we can no longer grow those dry farm crops because they are not high-value crops. Um, and like I said, the reality is we do assign a monetary number to these items. Um, so we have to look at high-value crops and grow those in order to maintain the land. Strawberry is also a water-intensive crop. You need a lot of water to grow it. Um, now, I don't view that as wasted water personally. I view it as I think that farmers and farm workers export water because that water is directly used to grow something useful to sustain life. Um, but I know a lot of the public um, in different hearings that I've been to with the Ventura County Board of Supervisors feels that ag really needs to cut down on water. So in the absence of an alternative solution, um, which are also not popular, <laughs> like using recycled water, um, taking water from the river, stormwater capture, desalination, there are pros and cons to all of these, right? I'm just throwing out a few. Um, 
in the absence of really doing something like that to provide more water to our farmers, farm workers aren't going to have jobs, and that is my principal concern as a farm labor contractor. Farmers are going to have to follow their land. They're not going to be able to sell it because who wants to buy land that doesn't have water rights to grow anything that can actually pay the bills? Um, so that is the trajectory that I see us on. Now, in an optimistic perspective, I'm super glad we're having this conversation because I really think that, I don't think it's malice that these things are happening. I think people are just unaware. Um, and so I, I'm hopeful that we'll continue to have these conversations and that the public will speak up in meaningful ways. And I think one way that might be something people want to consider is um, agriculture is an industry, it is a job, and it is not for um, public benefit. And what I mean by that is it's not a part, right? But we could change that if we wanted to um, let the public have input over what time our tractors fire up in the morning. That's something I've heard before in front of the uh, Ventura County Board of Supervisors. We'll have people come in and say, oh, the, I live next to a farm and it's beautiful, but gosh, they're so loud. Five in the morning, they're firing up their tractors, I can't sleep. All right, well, there's reasons why we do that, right? And it's because it's a business and crops never stop growing. And also from uh, the farm labor perspective, we need to avoid things like heat illness, which is a very real concern working outdoors under the sun. So we need to start a little earlier sometimes. But if the public feels that they have the right to impose some of those things that are not beneficial to the business side of agriculture, then maybe we can look at subsidizing, right? And then that would really make the public have a vested interest um, in agriculture and be able to, um, you know, set certain parameters that are convenient to the public, not to the farmer and the farm worker, right? So I think that that is one perhaps positive way that we could move forward and look at 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the way and find something that maybe is mutually beneficial to all parties. Thank you. Matthew? So um, I think in the sort of 10-year horizon, unfortunately, um, Ventura County's sort of economic trajectory looks a lot like the last 10 years. That's to say, um, you know, unfortunately, less economic inclusion over time, growing inequality as we sort of, um, as we live with some of the uh, decisions of the past. But I do really see that the 20 year, 50 year tra uh, trajectory for Ventura County is much, much brighter. Um, I sort of hinted at this in the collaboration I talked about before. I wanted to share one more quote. This is from E.J. Remsen, who many in the room will know. So he's the senior project director for Ventura County for the Nature Conservancy. Um, and he actually said, and this is his quote, agriculture is a good neighbor to Ventura County's environment, um, and open space and other environmental assets. Agriculture supports our conservation goals. So just as we saw the collaboration on the housing side, What's really interesting is, you know, I see uh, EJ and the Nature Conservancy have been part of some really powerful collaborations with agriculture, right, working to invest in the sustainability of agriculture. Um, they designed a system to purchase uh, flood rights along the Santa Clara River, right? Farmers could channelize the Santa Clara River so that it doesn't flood on, onto their farms. And Nature Conservancy says, hey, guess what? Let it flood and we will make you whole economically. We will pay you to let the banks overflow because that sustains a, uh, a healthy riparian ecosystem, right? And so that's really exciting collaboration. And so in each of these cases that I've talked about, again, it's this recognition of, uh, of the value of the environment and environmental conservation, all of the services, the environmental services it provides us, right? It's also understanding of the, of the, of the really acute need to build more housing Right? And that will, uh, unfortunately, that will require uh, changes to, probably changes to urban growth boundaries um, in modest ways. And then there's also this recognition that actually agriculture isn't just part of the, cult, the cultural fabric of our community. It actually supports quality of life in Ventura County in a whole number of ways. Uh, and so it's those, that the sort of those common recognitions make me really, really bullish on Ventura County um, that I think we will see meaningful changes to land use policy, thoughtful changes to land use policy in the years ahead, that we will start to tackle the housing crisis, that will continue to support, permanently protect um, the, uh, the most important environmental assets, you know, the most uh, sensitive ecosystems uh, in, in the county. Um, and, and again, uh, uh, and I, I hope start to, in more meaningful ways, support the long-term sustainability of agriculture. 
So as a nonprofit person, um, we tend to think of things in terms of our strategic plan, which we develop at a five-year stretch. So 10 years, that's only two strategic plans away, right? That's going to come really quickly. Um, so things that I can think of in the next 10 years, our Mariano Rancho Preserve will be fully open to the public. More land in our region will be conserved. Um, broader than that, beyond our own you know, nose, end of our nose. The development projects that are being approved right now in all of the different cities throughout Ventura County may or may not have been built by that point, depending on the state of the economy. Um, the wildlife crossing in Calabasas will be built. Thankfully um, and hopefully, there may be another one near the Conejo grade here in Ventura County. There's a study going on about that right now. Um, and hopefully the one in Calabasas, the largest in the world it will be, will have been proven to be a huge success at that point. Um, vulnerable wetlands properties, um, like at Ormond Beach and McGrath State Beach, um, hopefully will have been protected and will be being restored. Uh, the battle against Arundo is likely to be going on still within our watersheds. And speaking of our watersheds, maybe, hopefully, the Matillaha Dam has come down. In tw I know, I'm, I'm hopeful, right? <laughs> 20 years, climate change's impacts will have become more noticeable. We will have more frequent wildfires that will make the wildland urban interface, or the WUI, um, even more dangerous and complicated than ever. Uh, riparian preserves along our rivers may be struggling during prolonged drought, particularly if we're still fighting Arundo at that point. Um, if Ventura County continues to warm at its current rate, by the way, we are the fastest warming county in the lower 48, we will see native plant and wildlife struggling. SOAR will be coming up for renewal soon at that 20 year mark. Will the housing pressures of this slow growth um, county finally overcome the will to preserve that balance of developed versus non-developed land. In 50 years, I project myself here a lot because like I said, we make decisions trying to think about forever. Um, hopefully the, those decisions have had significant impact. 30 by 30 at that point will be far in the rear view mirror. Will it have been enough? Some biologists argue that we should have a goal of protecting 50% of our open space, that 30% is not high enough. Um, will we be in a post-oil and gas extraction era in Ventura County by that point? What will happen to farming and ranching? Will we have adequate housing? Will we have adequate transportation? How will we have solved our water issues? So I don't know, but I know that those are all big questions that have a lot of intersectionality between our groups. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If we don't take a look at how we're working and building now in 10 years, I just see doom all through these. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I feel is really important is that this, the county should put a, no, a new buildings. There should be no non-native plants. It should all be native landscapes. No more grass. Let's get rid of the grass. Uh, let's bring, you know, our night skies back. Our ridge lines are, you know, over here on the avenue and all coming up from Ojai. It, I, it's horrific. I just like, can we, can we just, you know, con consume less, recycle more, get more involved in, in our communities and, and helping the communities that are disadvantaged with food. We are so disposable with our clothes, our food, our cars. And, and there are people, my, my mother comes from that uh, migrant workers from 1900 coming out here from Guanajuato, Mexico. She was born in Riverside. And that was their life, moving from place to place, from field to field, from LA to San Jose. <laughs> and they settled here in Camarillo and her sister's working at the Canet Ranch. That's for sale right now. I don't know what's going on with it. Just leave it alone. <laughs> you know, it's 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 near uh, places where sacred waters were used. 
it's by a, a place that has a voodoo shrine in our time because we weren't warrior-like. We got even other ways. So I see, you know, again, an oak tree, for instance. We should be planting our oaks back and putting our oak groves back. It is going to give us that carbon cleanup we need. It is our breathing buddies. And if you leave the mulch on the ground, just an example, how many of you are reading Nature of Oaks? It's a great book. Anyway, he talks about a, a two-inch a two deluge of rain. That oak tree, that mulch will capture over 540,000 gallons of water. Put it right back into the ground. That fills our aquifers. We, 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 we want everything all pristine and clean. And there are animals and species who only live off that mulch. So we're killing a species by all our cleanups. So let's get our hands dirty. And you know, I, I see more fires if we don't get rid of that Arundo. Uh, I see more earthquakes because of what is going on in the oil industry. And, and I see um, more people being pushed out and traveling further and further to their jobs because they can't afford. That's why a lot of our people moved out of the area in the 50s and 60s, couldn't afford the houses, couldn't find jobs. A great example, my father had to change his name from Tumamaya to Lopez to get work growing up because they would hire the Mexicans, but not the Indians. I mean, it was, it was like you think of what? But, you know, it's, 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 the truth is horrific and it's sad. And so a lot of our people are displaced and people are being displaced right before our very eyes. So yes, we desperately need that housing and to, so, to keep our workers home, close to work, safe, and, and, and not to have that burden of where their meal's coming from. The homeless right now is another, the, the drugs that are involved in all of that. I, I, I went and made the mistake and watched Painkillers on Netflix. How many of you seen that one? That's just our epidemic of drugs, the Oxycontin story. So, you know, again, that all of that, um, I'm glad the marijuana is kind of on mor um, moratorium. You know, we really, in our, in our ag, you know, looking at um, one, one man that was on World Ocean Days, he's turning seawater into fertilizer. Did you know that? He's, he's doing something with it, and he has a company here in Ventura County where he's collecting ocean water, and he's teaching people how to use it as fertilizer. And it was long, complicated, scientific, nerdy stuff. So I didn't quite get it all. Another woman here is turning in a recycling good plastics, or as close as you can get to a good plastic, and turning it into jet and diesel fuel. Another man is hiring divers to collect the zombie urchins down below who's eating all of our kelp. And then he's regrowing the zombie urchins to sell for food in restaurants. I mean, there's some innovative people out here doing things that we're not aware of. And they're amazing. They're, they're doing amazing things. So, you know, again, this, it, it, we, we are the village now, you know, and we really have to start, you know, getting the goals so we do make it to that 50 years, mm -hmm. that we can really, you know, all thrive economically and sustainably and ripping sage out of the earth right now at an abundant rate that it'll go extinct how can anybody think they're being cured by a plant that's being raped and pillaged out of the earth you know and if you're not aware of that it's getting torn out by the thousands and thousands of acres and being sold everywhere i even saw it in new mexico Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, we got a lot of uh, work to do in educating people in, in all of everything we've talked about today. And I just, you know, I hope you pepper us with questions because <laughs> I get kind of, you know, out there in my, my, um, my thinking. I want to, I, I loved everything that everybody, you know, we're all kind of on the same page here <laughs> and we have to be, you know, we have to really look at that place of helping one another. And, and right now, there's a lot of fear going on. Nobody wants to talk to anybody anymore. You don't want to look at anybody for fear. You know, there's so that, that's not anything to do with land. That's just how our, our pressure is right now on everybody. So, you know, we have to just, you know, help ourselves, protect ourselves, 
and 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 reach out out my mom her one of her when you give you get back sevenfold mm-hmm. yeah. and it is so true and so as we move in that place to to help those who for whatever reason we don't need to know that reason all you know is that's a brother or that's a sister and they need help and the land same thing those wildlife corridors are going to do some some good but when people don't stop at stop signs, they don't, you know, I don't use my blinkers. It's nobody's business where I'm going. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it, it, is, it is really hard right now, and we just, we, we're going to get through it. But um, there's going to be some more stuff coming along. I just I feel it. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that really inspiring message. I wanted, it's been a little bit since we heard from Melissa or, or Matthew, and I wanted to just see if you had... Uh, anything else you wanted to share, maybe uh, 60 to 90 seconds of thoughts uh, to help us wrap up. Yeah. Yeah, I think just in closing, I would just like to encourage everybody to take the time to meet a farmer and meet a farm worker. I'm not saying meet a landowner from the OC that bought land super cheap here and now leases it out. I'm saying actually go out and meet a farmer that is on his farm daily, meet a farm worker that is actively working in agriculture, and just listen to what they have to say. And I think maybe you'd be surprised about maybe some of the preconceived notions that most of us had before. I mean, before I entered the ag industry, I didn't really know anything about it, right? So. Um, yeah, I think you can read stuff about an industry. You can even have family members that have worked in it, but until you're actually in it, you just don't know all the little nuances. So that's what I would say in closing. I just encourage everybody to take the time to do that. Excellent. Awesome. Um, going back to Drew's framing, right, that, that, that the balance is between jobs, the environment, housing. I, I sort of see that from an economic perspective. But what's unique about that framing is what he says next is, and in the middle is quality of life. And so one of the things that I'm excited about, it's sort of, I sort of see this awakening happening across Ventura County the last decade, is that we used to think that there was a trade-off between growth and quality of life. And I actually think we're actually, uh, the data reveal that actually, um, uh, that you actually need growth you need jobs, right? You need upward economic mobility for our residents. You need broadly shared prosperity to make sure that quality of life is accessible to all of the members of our community. Uh, and so I think that equity piece becomes really important. Uh, and so I think that, that recognition that there's not a tension between um, economic growth and environmental conservation, economic growth uh, uh, and other issues is really important. Uh, and there is a balance that exists where we can provide broadly shared prosperity. It does. It, it will necessitate some changes in policy at the at the county and local level. Uh, but again, I I'm pretty excited that uh, that 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 so many stakeholders are working together for common goals. Uh, and so I really see a bright future for the county. Excellent. All right, Melissa, do you want to have the the last word? Wow, this is such a treat. <laughs> um, you know, land and water use are at the core of sustainability. Uh, we are in a closed system here on our planet. So that means that there's no throwing something away. There's no away. Um, the decisions that we make regarding the use of our resources have long-ranging impacts in time and space. And if we take our true wealth of our planet which is our clean air, our clean water, our biodiversity, and we allow us to continue to convert it into ones and zeros that sit in somebody's bank account, then what have we done? And so I think it's really important, and I hope Matthew doesn't feel I'm beating up on him in economics because <laughs> I know he's studied this from an environmental lens, um, it's really important that we factor in the cost to our environment and the cost to our people as part of the cost of doing business. And we have not done that in our society. And so that would be my closing statement. Thank you. Wow, that was a really, really, really fantastic discussion.
I really want to thank all of you. It's not easy to come up here and ha answer these tough questions. It's not easy to stay in your time limit, listen to what other people are saying, try to adjust what you're saying. And you know, you all did a fantastic job. And I think everybody in this room learned something and thought about something that they hadn't thought about previously. And I also, I wanna thank the Museum of Ventura County and especially uh, Leila Banoon Kaseke uh, for hosting this panel. We need spaces to have this kind of discussion, right? I was talking with John uh, earlier, you know, this is kind of the foundation of our democracy, right? Is having these public forums where we can dig into these deep issues and inform better decision making and everybody get engaged in shaping the future of our county. And I know that there was so much that was left unsaid. And I invite you to invite your neighbor for a beer or a sparkling water at one of our finest, uh, fine downtown establishments in walking distance, or hop on the uh, museum's Facebook page to continue this robust conversation. So thank you all for, for joining us today.